alignment is the first thing and setting up an environment where um, people speak up is the second one. Especially today, your best people in your team, if you don't give them the platform to speak up, they'll leave. They don't want to be in a company where they get pushed down. I have a question. No, don't worry. May I add this? Not today. Later. The Zoom is done. We're at the top of the hour. We need to close now. They'll leave. Hey there, folks. Thanks so much for joining us on another episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. I am very excited today, as I always am, but today we have twice as many amazing guests. So today I am joined by Octavian Batish and Emil Dobrovsky, who are the authors of Dark Cockpit, How to Communicate, Lead, and Be in Control Like an Airline Pilot. Gentlemen, how are you today? Fine. It's a pleasure to meet you, Anthony, and everybody who's listening or watching. Thank you very much for the invitation. Awesome, guys. I'm so excited. So let's start off by the beginning. What had you write this book? And maybe, Emil, I'll start with you. Why did you write this book? Why is it important? Why does the world need it right now? For the last 30 years or so, I was uh, and I've been a professional pilot working, flying for the Romanian national carrier in uh, Romania. And for the last 18 years, I have a European Aviation Agency Safety Agency license as an uh, examiner, as a senior examiner. And um, little by little over time, I discovered that in my cockpit, in our rules, in aviation, there's a, um, there's a huge know-how you can borrow to other parts of the business, to other industries. And I met Octavian, and he's a well-known entrepreneur and a writer of uh, bestsellers in Romania and not only in Romania. So we met, I've been uh, doing speeches in front of different audiences and he proposed me to write a book based on my speeches, on my ex personal experience in my aircraft. So I said, uh, I, thought, I, I thought for about two seconds, I said, why, what not, why not uh, to write the book together? So this um, came as a natural, uh, uh, outcome of our friendship, of our collaboration of in uh, with his company. So the book is uh, now on the shelves everywhere and is on Amazon. It's Dark Cockpit. And I will let Octavian uh, tell you what it's all about, about around this uh, mysterious name. Yeah, I met, uh, I met Emil about 10 years ago. And um, every time I met him, he had great stories to share and great, I, I, which, from which I learned a lot uh, and used in my business. And then we invited him to speak to our team and everyone was impressed of the stories, but also of the value that we could take from, from those speeches. And then we invited him to customers as a guest speaker. And we could see that people from all areas, from, from pharma, from banking, from different other industries, found value in what they were doing. And uh, talking about just to give you a, a, a quick sample at the beginning. One thing that happens in aviation a lot is checklists. Check, there's a checklist for this, there's a checklist for that, there's a checklist for the other one. Uh, and they do that, why? Because the stakes are very high. No flight moves, okay, uh, are we done preparing the cockpit? I think so, let's go ahead, right? You've never hear, heard it uh, as a passenger, you never hear a captain saying things like, uh, I think we're pretty much ready to go. Uh, we'll see, uh, we're gonna try some new things today. Uh, let's hope we'll have a fun flying today. You know You'd be scared if it happened, right? So there's a checklist. And if you study, for me, it was fascinating as we were, I was researching this book and spending a lot of time with Emil and then interviewing and then discovering what they do. Um, the fact that they'd run these checklists one by one without the feeling that, oh, come on, I'm a, I've, I've been a pilot for 20 something years. Do I still need a, a checklist? I mean, no, they, they, they don't think that, they don't do that. They run the checklist, right? If it's a two flight leg, they fly from A to B, they land at B, they have an after landing checklist, they have a parking leg. And then half an hour later, maybe they, didn't, they don't even leave the cockpit. The new passengers come in, they're bored, everything is fine. Before they leave, there's a checklist again and they check fuel again. And none of them says, oh, come on, it's the same fuel. I mean, nothing happened to it. Now, by contrast, what do you see in companies? In companies, you see many people who feel like and think like and sometimes even say like, no, I've been in this, <laughs> Would you, uh, I've been in business for 20 years, I don't use, need a checklist before I meet a customer, I know what to say. And then after the meetings, oh, I forgot to ask that, I forgot to bring that up. So uh, one quick takeaway for everybody uh, and for myself was, was use checklists. 
There is nothing, you know, pilots have this aura when they walk through airports, everyone steps aside and the, the pilot is uh, six feet tall and whatever. Yes, they are, but they use checklists. Why? Because they know it's important to do that. And checklists have, um, uh, there's, a, there's a good book written by Atul Gawande, The Checklist Manifesto, who talks about how, how checklists went into the hospital, um, I don't want, to, don't want to call it industry, but in the hospital field. And uh, the, the huge improvements that checklists brought into the quality of care so there's a lot of value for checklists. So if for some reason our connection stops, what can our viewers take away? Have a checklist, use the checklist. Of course, we have some mental checklists before we go somewhere, but have it written down, have it handy. We've got our phones all the time. It's super, and it double, talk about execution, right? We have a meeting today, we have a meeting next week. What happened? Well, A, B, C, D should have happened, but we forgot about D, not entirely, but we forgot something. And it's bad because maybe one that week will never get back. So let's have a plan, let's have it written down, let's have a checklist, let's decide who does what. It's old school, but it works today too. You might not write it on paper, but have it on some app, that everybody sees from Slack to whatever, but make sure there is one that everybody sees and everybody follows. So and if, I, if I add something, just, just one more thing to add. It's so difficult as a leader, as a leader of your team, I spent uh, 16,000 hours in my aircraft and I spent more than six hours, 6,000 hours in a simulator as a student and most of them as, a, as an instructor or examiner as a leader is the most difficult thing to, to teach your team, to grow your team on, based on this skeleton of their, what they are doing, you know, to follow the procedure, to follow the SOP. And the most difficult as a leader is to be an example following them. Because you know, of course, you met that situation before. Of course, you went there before. Of course, the situation um, looks like another one you were before. But uh, the most difficult thing is to, to let your uh, team to realize and to, to make their own decision because doing this it's not only the leader's responsibility the outcome it will become a responsibility and it will uh, rely on other people's shoulders in your team because there's no people in your team in my aircraft there's no people um, in plus all the seats are occupied for a reason all the crew seats are occupied for a reason. So it's very difficult as a leader to let them do mistakes sometimes, to learn, to make the loop of the rethinking their actions very quickly and to correct the action. Otherwise you have to intervene. But it's difficult to, to make people to follow the SOP all the time. So let's, let's take all of that because that was a lot of information for our listeners who jumped right in and said, okay, he's just because gave us the, the, all, everything. But what I hear, so the book, uh, communicate, lead, and be in control because the stakes are very high. So, you know, you might not be in your business. You may be dealing with someone's life like on a day-to-day -day basis and a lot of businesses are. So you need to be able to communicate, be in control. Uh, working together for you guys so that you have the same sort of understanding. It wasn't explicitly said, but what really was the highlight was, was the checklist each and every time because you do not have the luxury of being able to make mistakes and because you've got people's uh, life on the line. And then you had mentioned the checklist manifesto um, so that everybody follows the thing. And one thing that I sort of was wondering and curious about as it relates to cross culture, so you guys are Romanian, you have to fly a bunch of different places. And when you land, I imagine that like the process is the process. It's not like, oh, here's our checklist that we have in Romania. Here's our checklist that we have in Korea. Here's the checklist we have in Canada. Because if you're working with, I imagine you probably have the same team as you work with them. But what is the culture of being a pilot and how does that translate into that sort of consistency process, please? And Octavia, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with you because I think that because you have to go a whole bunch of different places, you can't really sort of do it your own way. Yeah, well, in aviation, it's easy. Uh, you can have in the cockpit a pilot from country A and a pilot from country B and they'll fly the plane because they have the standard operating procedure, the language is the same, communication procedures is fine. Uh, by contrasting companies, it's not always the same. Now the world has become a much smaller place with Zoom and with online calls, so things are aligned a little bit, but uh, I'm an entrepreneur, we have an international training and consulting company, and we were brought in by one of the big FMCG multinationals to teach some, some skills. One of the topics was project management. Now, 
and they said that, uh, and this was a global global deal. So we were supposed to cascade down uh, project management workshops for people in about 70 countries. They shared with us that before this initiative happened, they were doing local initiatives on project management. And they noticed they had no less than 23 different project management workshops that they were running. Now, no, of course, no training, no training says good white is black and black is white but still you need the same understanding of what is a gun chart what is a SWOT, what is this what is that and when when that is not uh, happening there's a lot of misunderstanding let me give an example in some countries if you say uh, it's urgent please do this uh, now in some companies that means i drop everything else and i deal with what you've asked me to do right in some countries if you tell this, it means that, yeah, sometime today or, or, or tomorrow, so definitely this week, I'll deal with it. So if you have an expatriate from a country accustomed to urgent means, drop everything, do this, coming and working with the team says, urgent, yeah, we'll find. And, and, and then, for instance, I, I met with a German CEO who was working in Romania, and says, I, I, he just came in, and after a couple of weeks, we met over lunch, and how do you find Romania? He said, I find it fascinating. He says, I discovered that urgent has another, um, uh, It's you have urgent and you have very urgent. As for me, I don't understand what very <laughs> urgent means, because for me, urgent meant you drop everything and you do that. But here they ask me, is it urgent? Yes. Or is it very urgent because it's so it's tough so uh, whose responsibility is it to align it's the leader's responsibility right and um if you are part of a team of course you can you can say i can't do my job because of this of this of that or that if you lead a team do whatever you can to align uh, things if you're part of a team don't take the role of the leader but just ask a question what do we understand by that when you say urgent by when do you mean it so um and that is the first step. You have to align terms with everybody that you're working with, because if you don't align terms, you'll get into trouble or someone will get into trouble or even worse, the customer will get into trouble because he was promised something by someone and now somebody else is dealing with that uh, to different standards, for instance. And if you say, uh, let's have a great party for our customers before the fourth wave or one fifth wave or whatever wave hits, let's make sure we have a great party. The term great party, might mean different things to different people. To some people, it might mean um, a cello and a violin somewhere in the corner playing nice, nice music, good food. For some other people, it would have not anything to do with cellos and violins. It would have a band and drinks and everything. So it's different. So to make a long story short, yes, there are many differences. Uh, the job of aligning everybody is one of the first jobs because without this, you cannot communicate. Aviation has figured this out for years. They speak in English. They speak with the towers in English. Romanian pilots, the Romanian tower, they speak in English. The French um, or the German, they speak in, that's the international language. There's always a number of aircrafts around who can, who should um, be uh, warned if something happens. So this has done, this was done a long time ago because if this is not done, there's a risk uh, mm -hmm. and we should do it in companies too. Yeah. And so the takeaway for, for our listeners, and then I invite you to do is reflect on, is that clarity there? And on the podcast, yeah. on our videos, we always talk about alignment, clarity, responsibilities, but it really highlights the important. And I think the undertone of what you said, Octavian, is, is the culture. And, and we always yeah. talk about culture. Um, Emil, when you had mentioned, hey, I spent like 6,000 hours in simulators and I had to go through pilot school, I had to do all of this stuff because they ingrain the culture of checklists. It's not like you show up day one as a pilot and you say, you know what I really love? I love checklists. It's they have yeah. to build that culture, including expectations, clarity, communication, and make sure that there's 100% alignment. So as a leader, look and say, hey, do we have that alignment? Is our culture aligned? Is our understanding aligned? And even something as uh, we had a, an issue with our team this week. Somebody was posting in Slack a bunch. And I was like, it didn't seem like there was an action item. And she said, well, I want to know if you actually got my communication or not, because I feel yeah. like I'm just posting here. So I didn't see anything to do. So we had to align just in that one instance to make sure we're on the same page. Okay, we're, we're moving yeah, through stuff. In aviation, so we, have a, we have a word in aviation. It sounds very sad. And uh, Grasson is, uh, the aviation history is written in blood. So for us, uh, communication is paramount. I know that uh, everywhere in the world, when when something happens in your personal life, in your business, uh, some uh, first to blame is the communication. 
But for us, it's really, really important to communicate well with a share, you share the same cockpit with uh, pilots from all over, literally all over the world. Now, aviation world is a small one. So I, I shared my, my cockpit with literally people from all over the world, from different culture, different education. We have the same language, the cockpit, which is SOP. And also the communication is very direct and impersonal. When somebody, uh, if I hear my 250 year hours uh, experience co-pilot yelling at me, landing gear down, I will realize in a second, I have 16,000 hours. He's yelling at me or she's yelling at me. Yeah, because she was trying to, uh, to put emphasis that she already told me twice and I will thank her for this feedback. I will lower the gear and I will thank her or he, uh, him afterwards because of this, you know? So the communications, it's, it's meant to be in a cockpit or in a business to be impersonal. Just mm. say the right words on the right moment, be honest and direct. And in the I cockpit, think it's paramount. And I think that's something that really gets lost. I was, uh, you know, I always try to bring my personal experiences. I was digging a trench in my house with my father-in-law and we're doing this construction project. And he's like, if I'm trying to get you something, I'm on a job site. Even though he's my father-in-law, we're on a job site and it's just about the job. And I saw Gordon Ramsay say, this is not personal feedback. This is professional feedback and yeah. take it as such. And I think that's so interesting. So I want to I want to follow on this, but I don't want to lose one thing. We talked about communication a lot. And I want to get your perspectives on the importance of an air traffic controller and how does that relate to business. But before we do that, we talk about your co-pilot being the person that can basically call you out on whatever. And there's, you know, a tragic, unfortunately, you know, a tragic incident. And those are the ones we learn from where the co-pilot didn't speak up because of a cultural background because of like an entrenched culture of of not even airport culture like a ethnicity background culture of hey you do not speak over your your first in command so can we maybe just for like a minute or two talk about the risks of having a, an entrenched culture that doesn't support your objectives so maybe uh, octavian i can go with you first and then emil after what are the risks of having an entrenched culture that doesn't serve your interests the risks is that you uh, you fail your mission, whatever the mission that be, you lose a customer, you lose profitability, because if uh, as an entrepreneur, of course, it's tempting to uh, want to be the one who makes all the decisions. But if you have a team of five or 50 or a thousand, uh, that means five minds, 50 minds, 1000 minds who have their own experience. And it, it's a pity not to utilize that uh, experience in aviation. Again, this lesson was learned in aviation because of so many accidents that happened because the pilot was too shy uh, or the co-pilot was too, or, or the pilot was too aggressive. And there's a concept called CRM, crew resource management, where the pilots are instructed to speak up. The, the, the captains are instructed to ask questions, to be more open because um, um, uh, four eyes see better than two eyes. And the experience of two people in the cockpit is, is, is better than to rely just on one. And in business, what does it mean? It means, yes, but I have 10 people who are meeting customers every day. What do you mean not ask them enough? What does the customer say? What does the customer want? That's just, just risking uh, serving the customers with the things they don't want and investing a lot of money into some new feature that they don't really want, but I thought it would be nice. Well, it might be money lost. So uh, alignment is the first thing and setting up an environment where um, people speak up is the second one, especially today. The, your best people, uh, the, the best people in your team, if you don't give them the platform to speak up, they'll leave. They don't want to be in a company where they get pushed down. I have a question. No, don't worry. May I add this? Not today. Later. The Zoom is done. We're at the top of the hour. We need to close now. They'll leave. And the war for talent is, is, is worse than today than any because people can, your, your best people can work not only for one or two companies who are good in your city, but they can work for companies all over the world. And sooner or later, they will. So if you want to keep them, if you want to have your people engaged, if you don't want to be spending too much time re-recruiting and re-recruiting and re-recruiting, really treat well the ones you have. How? Doesn't automatically mean double their salaries every two weeks. Of course, they love it. But there are ways in which they feel better because they, they feel that their contribution is um, is is wanted and it's, and it's used for. And that's, that's one of the best things that you can do as a leader. 
Mm. Uh, I was in this insight in my personal life. I was watching a Master Chef episode. By the way, spoilers coming. And one of the guys <laughs> that got eliminated, he didn't get eliminated because he wasn't a good chef. He got eliminated yeah. because the challenge was he needed to work with his partner. He didn't communicate. He just listened to them, and he lost out. So some people think that you know it's like you you uh, holding a grudge is like drinking your own poison it's the kind of thing like you will hurt yourself and you will hurt those around you if you don't communicate uh emil uh, importance of um yeah that communication and, and going over sort of a risk culture um, look i know it's uh, against uh, some people will think or it's non-intuitive what i will say but accepting as a leader accepting the feedback of your team or teaching them to give you the feedback will help you um construct better, the project uh, you're doing, your outcome will be better because you can rely on people that they will, uh, as Octavian said, you have to, only two eyes. If in a cockpit, you have a co-pilot who dare to tell you speed or to correct you, this will help you uh, to improve your flight. And this will help you to, to on your workload, workload, your workload is ease. So we can, you can uh, concentrate and focus and build your decision better in an in a emergency situation or in a normal flight. Mm. So instructing your people to give you the feedback and accepting it, it's a matter of uh, leadership actually. It's communication, it's a proper leadership and they will grow, your, the, the, the team you're, you're uh, leading will grow like this. It's, uh, it's non-intuitive, but in aviation we, we learn it on the hard way so we, for so many years, for so, for, so, for so many times, years ago, you can hear a very authoritative uh, a captain yelling in a cockpit or giving orders like this, and you hear nothing from the co-pilot side until they crash. So th those times are over. It's not longer possible like this, but this is a gift aviation can give to the world. Build your team or grow, make them grow by giving them, um, uh, the opportunity to speak and to give you the feedback, the real feedback, not to just to, uh, I don't know, to make you feel well or better. Because at the yeah. end of the day, my flight is my project. And uh, when they say, uh, Captain Dobrovolsky, welcome you on board, uh, it's my flight. But my flight, my project will be better if I work together with my team and my co-pilot, doesn't matter how unexperienced he or she is, will give me the right feedback at the right moment. Yeah, to ap approaching or in ingraining that attitude. By the way, in that spirit, listeners, if you have any feedback on our podcast, please leave it in the comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe, but really genuinely appreciate your feedback because there are more of you than there are of me and our team. So being able to get your perspective is critical. Okay, guys, I got two questions for you. You know, you mentioned the fourth wave, the fifth wave, COVID, all of that stuff. Why is it important for leaders to really um, be able to lead effectively in chaos? As in, you know, the world could be chaotic right now. You know, what are some of those key characteristics? We talked about communication. We talked about listening. We talked about culture. We talked about checklists. What else do leaders need to consider uh, uh, when they are leading through chaos? And I'll start with you. Look, in aviation, we have landmarks. And uh, based on that landmarks, you, you, you make plans, you make a strategy for unexpected. This COVID thing, nobody expecting it. And uh, the, the outcome I took from myself is, was the resilience part of a pilot that uh, I can, I can uh, work in, I, I work in a stressful environment I work in a dangerous situations sometimes. The, I, uh, the entire outside environment is against me. Uh, it's not easy to make a, um, 164 tons of a chunk of metal to fly, you know, together with other 250,000 uh, flights a day. So this part of me, of the resilience I, I uh, practice in my uh, everyday uh, routine, I, I use it to overcome the the fact that uh, I was not uh, I was not flying anymore as as often as I was flying before the COVID, I was not uh, um, the training I took. It was most in the simulator. Um, I was uh, sitting on the ground. I was grounded during the entire his, uh, uh, aviation, so it was uh, difficult for all of us to cope with this. 
but I always found uh, resilience. Uh, I, I found uh, support in the fact that the passengers, uh, there will be a mom moment, the, will, the aviation will start again, and it started again. Mm -hmm. And th when they will start, they will start with uh, trained people, with the pilots, because when you buy a ticket with your family, you have no guilt to step into an untrained pilot. So what I, what I learned on, my, on myself and I, I share it with my team, with my students, it was exactly this. Prepare every day like you are flying tomorrow again or prepare every day like you have an exam tomorrow. Why? Because you'll be uh, uh, top of your knowledge, of your skill. And the attitude is this, to be open for uh, the, the future, not to... to stay on the ground and feel sorry for yourself because the 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 sky is empty of aircraft yeah. i yeah. love that uh, you know, yeah they say uh, a dog is a man's best friend i i don't want to compete with that but I, I i'm suggesting the second best friend is a question and that question is what if and especially for a leader it's it, it's great if if as leaders we ask this question what if that happens what if that happens what if that happens and thinking about as many scenarios as we can because yeah who knows what will happen i might not have uh, foreseen exactly the scenario that is happening but if i thought about two or three different similar thing things that will help me make a bad uh, a good decision there you know some people ask us in trainings um in the leadership training uh, should the leader be an example and say that's <laughs> that's the wrong question the leader is an example whether they want to or not they are an example it's not like friends yeah this week's this week uh, don't look at me uh, i'm having a bad week i'm not a good example no they look at the leader all the time, especially when something bad happens. Now it doesn't have to be COVID, but it have to be. It, it could be a call where fifteen people on the screen in a Zoom call, and one guy says, uh, "You know what? We lost our biggest customer today." And if everything is, if everybody in the call is on video, which doesn't happen often, but eh, then people's eyes turn to the leader. Is he or she panicking? Is he or she starting to curse and start looking for blame? Or is he or she saying, okay, I know what to do. We need to call these people, the other customers who will take over the, the merchandise or whatever there is. So they do look up to the leader. So it's essential. Uh, in the emotional intelligence training, we talk about the fact that the leader's emotional response, everything is not just his or her problems. It's, it influences the team a lot. So control and, and be cool. But how can you do that? By asking yourselves, what if, what if, what if? And if you, uh, I've had a pleasure to discuss length uh, in length with Emil and watching videos and watch people. What does the, uh, the captain do? They're, they're cruising altitude, 12,000 feet. Every people are sleeping, working, whatever they're doing there. The captain might have a well-deserved coffee. While they have their coffee, they don't talk with the co-pilot about yesterday's match or tomorrow's politics game. They have their eyes on the tools. They have their eyes on the weather. Where are we? If something happens, where can we land? That's an airport here. We have the three planes. So they're constantly scanning everything so that if they need to intervene, they are prepared, just like Emil said. So as a leader, you cannot, the, the bad news is you cannot rest. You cannot say, oh, I'm on holiday. No, you, have, you have to scan what's going on. But I don't like that. But you, you will like the fact that uh, when something unexpected happens, you'll be prepared. And your people will like that too, whether you have five or 500. They will appreciate that. And not only it's not about, not only about liking, you'll be in business. You'll continue to be in business. You'll, you'll be ahead of your competition if that's what you like. You'll be able to keep your best people if that's what, if that's what you want. So if, the, if dog is man's best friend, fine. I'm suggesting the second best friend, the what if question. And constantly asking that and preparing questions because this way you'll be more prepared for what happens. Yeah, and I think one of the things that uh, being a leader is not necessarily about having the answers all the time and knowing it's about recognizing that when you are leading, people are looking to you. So, yeah. um, so I got one more question for you before I ask you about the book. Now, one of our colleagues, Chris, he shared with me something. He's like, great pilots, they, they don't take off unless they have somewhere to land. Like they need to know that they're going to land somewhere there. And part of that is being having that person that can guide them, that sees for them when they can't see. So in 30 seconds or less, what is the uh, importance of air traffic control for an airport and for pilots to be successful? Uh, okay, in 30 seconds or less, I'll go with you first. 
Well, they're key. You, you cannot really fly with them what, what, without them. What does it mean in business? Have a buddy, have a coach, have a mentor, have someone who's not in your business that you regularly meet with, that you bounce back ideas from. Have someone that you discuss. It could be your spouse. It could be a former employer. But make sure you have a network of people that you're constantly in touch with who can help you. It's, it's, it's not a... Um, um, a one game in one man game. It's a team sport. It has always been if you're if you're thinking about it in the right way. Perfect. And for Emil, me, for it's you? like a, for me, they are the cool head sitting on the ground with their screens and knowing what is in the air. Because on my screens, I can see airplanes. I can see other airplanes, but I cannot see what they are doing. So if I have an emergency or something, they're my best help. The air, con- air traffic controllers, and we rely on them. We rely on them to empty the sky for us. We rely on them to help us land. We rely on them for any emergency will uh, will come. So it's, uh, as I said, when I'm going to work, everybody around my aircraft, starting with the uh, technicians, uh, they're preparing my aircraft, uh, continuing with the loaders and uh, the load masters, with my crew, everybody, and the air traffic controllers on top of those, uh, we, I'm uh, I'm breathing oxygen, you know. I I will I will want for you to have a, such a, a work environment when everybody is professional at their top and they are trained and everybody knows uh, what to do. And and as as you guys were sharing, I was thinking, trying to place myself in our listeners' shoes, that you might be someone who is a frontline employee or a middle manager, and your air traffic controller is your boss or the CEO. And then if you're a CEO, your air traffic controller might be a board or might be your spouse, but having somebody who can see, you know, you're looking right in front of you, you need to have somebody who can see around you because they don't, and two eye or four eyes are better than two. So have someone that can see around and support you with what you don't know and you don't know what you don't know. Okay, guys, (laughs) as we, as we finish up, uh, where can people get your book? And is there like a final thought you want to share for our listeners and, and, uh, oh, there we go. Octavian's got yeah. it on the screen. There the most go. popular version people are getting the book is the Kindle version. So you can read it um, on any device you want. Dark cockpit, you can find it on Amazon, paperback also. Towards the end of the year, most likely we'll have the audiobook. If you go to uh, the website darkcockpitbook.com, you can download one of the chapters of the book and read it for free. It's 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 really uh, with placed there not the smallest one but probably the densest one in in know-how and in insights for leaders and for everybody who wants to um to improve the what, what they do if you'd like to get in touch with us you find us on linkedin octavian panti shemil dobrovolsky would love to hear from you if you have any questions that we that you have uh, definitely let us know awesome emil for you as we finish up and being at the end, I will not explain what dark cockpit means. I will let uh, the readers to find out by themselves. Uh, all I'm saying is not what you think. It's a, it's a good thing to have and leave and uh, lead your team in dark cockpit. So read the book, send us the um, uh, any feedback you have. I will be more than happy to respond. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. And really what I'm taking away from today, you know, I think there's parallels in in everything in the world, but I I can't think of many activities that have both such high risk, but also such sort of continuity to them. And there's and there's got to be lessons learned. And it's been many years since I've had to clap when a pilot lands. Um, And and that really speaks to, you know, what's what's put in place for you guys. And as somebody who flies across the world all the time and to all the pilots out there, like, thank you for getting us to where we want to go safe because you guys take the stress on every day and you wake up in those early mornings to make sure that you're prepared. Everything is organized and really like all flight crew, anybody who works in the airport, like from me, sincerest thanks because I know what goes into it. And for today, thank you so much for sharing with us. It's been uh, it's been a blast and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Anthony, for having us. Good luck to everybody. Thank you. So Bye-bye. thank you again to Emil Droblovolsky and Octavian Partish, who are the authors of Dark Cockpit, How to Communicate, Lead, and Be in Control Like an Airline Pilot. We'll put their contact in the show notes. We'll put the book in the show notes. Side note, I really love that logo. Somebody was very creative with that. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, guys. This has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My name is Anthony Taylor. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye, everyone.